Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for your prayers, your effectual prayers. I feel much better, and uh, we'll just move on from that and go to the Word of God now. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to study your Word. The Word of God should be the most important thing in our life, and we know that by putting the Word of God in our souls, we may glorify you, and that is the very purpose for which we are on this earth, is to glorify you. So, Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity this evening to study your word, and may God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration and the spiritual ability to convert gnosis into epinosis, and that means to have pneumatikos, and that's a Greek word which means spiritual phenomenon, something that the unbelieving world cannot understand. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, before, we had on the board this. And by way of review, our sin nature has an area of strength and an area of weakness. And in the area of weakness, that is the area of our temptation, whatever our weakness may be. Maybe we have a, a weakness toward fornication. Well, you are tempted in this area of weakness. Over here, we have an area of strength. Maybe you would never think of committing fornication in your area of strength, and therefore you would uh, commit another sin, such as gossip, maligning, or judging. And also, in the area of strength, from this you produce your human good and human evil. In other words, uh, in your area of strength, you can uh, do all sorts of good deeds and think you're doing wonderful, when in fact you're outside of the spiritual life, living under the sin nature in the energy of the flesh, and the only way to have production is to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. For God the Holy Spirit is the power of this life. And that would be the unique spiritual life up at the top. Now down here we have antinomianism versus legalism. And on one side, the antinomianism, his types of sin are the types of sin where he likes to go out and get drunk and have a good time, as he thinks it's a good time, and party hard and do drugs. And uh, usually these people end up uh, dying young from uh, some type of uh, liver disease or something else because they've ruined uh, their, their bodies through their chemical lust and also through their sexual lust. There's a lot of sexual diseases. So there's punishment related to the antinomian. Now the legalist over here, the legalist will always judge the antinomian. And that's because the antinomian commits sins that are... If I were the colonel, I'd be chewing some butt, wouldn't I? <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> All right. So the legalist uh, says to the antinomian, I would never do such a thing, you terrible person. And uh, therefore, it's very uh, judgmental. And that's sin, too. So there's sins on both sides of the spectrum. And actually, legalism is the hardest to break because this is blinding. You are blind when you judge somebody. You justify yourself in judging that person. You think you have a right to judge that person. And when you judge, what you are doing is actually acting like our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the judge, not you. So don't judge other people, even if they do commit fornication, adultery, or uh, they get drunk or do drugs. It's none of your business what they do. You live your own spiritual life. And this is hard to break from. This isn't so hard to break from. Do you know wh who Jesus won over the most? Well, you know why they called Jesus a wine bibber? And why did they call Jesus who hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors? Well, he went over to these people because these people responded easily to his word. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And these people over here believed it immediately because they knew they were sick. They knew they were sinners. Now, these people, they think they're already righteous. And Jesus says, believe in me. And they say, who are you, you arrogant fool? So it was hard to get these people to believe but it's very easy to get these people to believe. So you may think there might, there might be a lot of positive volition around here, but one thing that I've noticed about the South is that it is full of these people, and it's hard to break people on this side from legalism, and that's why you have to be tough, 
because uh, when I get up here and start shouting and you say, well, maybe you should be nicer about that, you got to kick legalism in the butt. you got to kick it right out. It won't go any If you're nice, if, if I were to say this is legalism and this is antinomy, it would go right over their head. And if I were to say, stop judging people! Live your own life! And then they might get it. And then they might walk out the door. And that's fine, because we don't want them here. All right, so let's get down some points after what I've shown you on the board. <clears throat> Point one, morality was designed for the entire human race. Morality is designed for the entire human race. Unbelievers can be very moral. In fact, and this is part of review, uh, the Jews are very moral. And in fact, you can meet Muslims who are moral. Sure, they'll cut off your head in a second, but in their, in their uh, lifestyle, they are moral. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't do these things. And a Baptist would come along and say, oh, that person must be a Christian. No! He's a Muslim. He's, a, he's an unbeliever. Morality is not part of, of the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life is spiritual. Now, when you're spiritual, you are moral, but morality is not part of it because guess what? Anything the unbeliever can do is not your spiritual life. And if the unbeliever can be moral, that is not your spiritual life. And the believer, too, can be moral. And the legalist is very moral, but they're still sinners. And in fact, they're part of the worst sins, gossip, maligning, and judging. And it's hard to break them from this. And they spin out of control, and they end up dying the sin face to face with death, which we have not studied yet, but we will study shortly. Point two, the unbeliever can be moral. And as I said, there are many Jews who are moral, and I guess I put those two points together. Point three, morality is not the basis for your salvation, nor is it the basis for our spiritual life after salvation. After you're saved and you go up to your pastor and you say, okay, I believed in Christ, now what? And he says, well, be good, brother. What does that mean, be good? It's a spiritual life that we have to live, and there's ignorance concerning that all around here. And if people heard this preaching, they would probably scream and run down the street because they've never heard of such stuff like this. But this is grace, and people need to understand grace. And that point four, if morality were the means of salvation, if morality were the means of salvation, the work of Christ on the cross would not have been needed. If you could be moral and be saved, then why would Christ have to die on the cross? The only issue would be, you be moral and you go to heaven. But that's not it. No moral, our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Point, point five, if morality were the means for our post-salvation spiritual life, Christ would have not needed to live the unique prototype spiritual life that he passed down to us. Now, I know for some of you who haven't been here very long or haven't been exposed to a lot of Bible doctrine, that's not your fault, but we need to learn these things. And since you're here now and you seem to be positive, then I'll teach you these things. And this is what I started to teach last time. Okay, we have a protocol. Now, everything has a protocol in life. Well, let's start with the prototype first. Prototype. And what is put spiritual life? This is what our Lord lived. He lived the prototype spiritual life. For 33 years on the earth, he was sinless and lived the prototype spiritual life. In other words, we haven't studied the entire spiritual life, but of course our Lord did not need to use rebound, which is 1 John 1, 9, but he was filled with God the Holy Spirit he did utilize the faith rest drill. He was grace-oriented. He was doctrinally oriented. He had a personal sense of destiny. He had personal love for God the Father. He had impersonal love for mankind. And he had plus H, which is sharing the happiness of God. And, of course, he did not need to be occupied with himself. That is left for us in the church age. Now, this might be flying right over a lot of your heads. And afterwards, I'm going to have that question and answer session. And if I can make it simpler for you, I will. 
So we have the prototype spiritual life. That's what Jesus Christ lived, and he lived it his whole life under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. GHS is how I'll put it. God the Holy Spirit. And we can be filled with that same power simply by utilizing 1 John 1, 9 and taking in Bible doctrine day by day by day. That's why I added Wednesday. And eventually, I'll add some more uh, later, not right now. So we have God the Holy Spirit, and then God the Holy Spirit fills when you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, then you are able to take in doctrine and God the Holy Spirit converts that uh, gnosis into epinosis and those are big words. Let's say you have, let's put it this way, let's say you have a low IQ. So what? We all have different IQs. So we'll put here human IQ. And you say, well, I, I, I'm having a hard time with this. I can't understand it. My IQ, is I just can't do it. Well, God in grace has, has given you something. And when you utilize 1 John 1, 9, and you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, you have human IQ plus uh, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And see, the filling of God the Holy Spirit takes whatever human IQ you have whether it be low, high, whatever. Now, you can be a genius, and if you don't have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, you'd never understand this. But whatever your human IQ is, so you have a human IQ. And then, if you're living the spiritual life, and you have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and this equals spiritual IQ. And that's what counts in life. If you think uh, human IQ counts, well, you're out of line because it doesn't. It doesn't matter if you're smart. The real genius is here, and I'll tell you why. Because in the prototype spiritual life, our, our Lord Jesus Christ suffered and suffered and suffered more than we could ever know. And he never broke down about it. He was on the cross and he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he didn't just scream it once. He screamed it over and over and over again in an agony that we could never understand. And how did he do it? The filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and the unique spiritual life. If you have this, you can handle any pain. Now, it might be terrible, but remember... It's never going to be as bad as what our Lord went through. Never, ever will it ever get that bad. He tested it to the maximum, and he never once sinned. He could have broke down and said, I can't take it anymore. Forget this. But he didn't. And that's part of his uh, impersonal love toward us. That's part of his personal love toward God the Father. And, and that is what he had. And he, what he has done is he has passed down to us what is called a protocol spiritual life. Now, everything in life has a protocol. In whatever field you work in, it has a protocol. If you work at McDonald's, you have a protocol. You don't throw the cheese on the grill first and then the hamburger. you got to put the hamburger and the cheese and then the bun. There's a protocol to it. And Jesus Christ lived the prototype, and that's what we follow, and this is what he has given to us in the protocol spiritual life. So we can live this unique life with the same filling of God the Holy Spirit. So imagine the power. We have this same power. Now we have the sin nature and we'll never be able to test this spiritual life as our Lord did. But we have phenomenal power in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. A phenomenal power. No matter what our IQ, if we're filled with God the Holy Spirit, we have what is called power. And it's an extreme power power, and it's actually the power that raised our Lord from the dead, and that's the power that is available to us if we want it, and all we have to do, it's very simple, is listen to the Word of God, be filled with God the Holy Spirit, listen to the Word of God, and you will grow spiritually, and you will reach play Roma to Theu, and that's Greek, and that means the fullness of blessing from God. And when you reach that, you have an impact on everyone around you. You have an impact on your friends, your family, your high school. And if you reach that, you have an impact on your country. And what we need in this country is for people 
to get away from legalism and start, especially Christians. This country is filled with Christians all over the place, especially here. I'd say 90% of the people here around uh, this area are Christians. Yet, they're filled with legalism and they're holding to a form of the spiritual life rather than living the true spiritual life and they're holding to legalism and they're gossiping and they're maligning and they're judging each other day after day and they're failures. And eventually, what God does is he has to punish his children. And if in one area there's a whole bunch of people who aren't listening to his word, he will smack them down with something uh, who knows what it is? It may be a terrorist attack, maybe some unknown disease, but they'll be smacked down and there will be suffering like you've never seen. But if you're in this spiritual life, of course, no matter what suffering comes your way, you don't care. You've got the unique spiritual life, plus God protects uh, the salt of the earth. He will protect He will protect those who have grown in grace and in the knowledge and have moved to play Roma. So let's take a look at the sins of the tongue the self-righteous person, and how a self-righteous person has a double standard. Point one, <clears throat> the legalism of self-righteous arrogance has rejected the great standards of doctrine. The tongue is used to flatter those you are trying to persuade with regard to slander, while at the same time slandering someone else. So there you see the double standard. They flatter on the one hand and slander on the other hand. And don't think for a moment that if uh, somebody is talking to you about somebody else, that the next day they won't be talking about you to somebody else. Remember the woman playing each one off the other just so she could have two friends? That's the way it works in the sin nature. Therefore, you can see the double standard. And on the other hand, the self-righteous legalist uses his tongue to slander or flatter while at the same, same time uses his tongue to shoot daggers. Point two, self-righteousness sets up a double standard of self-justification on the one hand while judging and maligning on the other hand. And while justifying the sins of arrogance, their sins of arrogance, these believers are guilty of the sins of the tongue. So they walk around as if they're sinless and they talk about everybody else and they justify what they do because they say, well, this person really did commit fornication and I just want to warn you about this person, brother. Well, that's gossip. It's none of your business. Stay out of people's business. Don't you have enough trouble in your own life to deal with? Don't you have enough in your own spiritual life to uh, get your pe nose out of other people's business? How stupid. Point three, in Psalms 12.2, there are two sins of the tongue involved. We have flattery of a role model followed by the feet of clay syndrome. Now this is very important and there's a big word related to it but it's, it's a really a simple thing to understand and I'll put this on the board. It's something called iconoclastic arrogance and that goes along with gossip, maligning, judging and all of those things. And so I hope I spell this right. I don't know if the O or A. Iconoclastic arrogance. Now you see the root of this word is icon. What you do is you make an icon out of somebody. And up here, I will draw a circle for a pedestal. This is a pedestal. Now you can put anybody you want on this pedestal. A politician, this happens a lot. Somebody thinks a president's going to going to save them and then all of a sudden the president does something they don't like so they want to rip him down. But a lot of times it happens to pastors. A lot of people, well let's put pastor because it happens a lot to pastors. People think pastors are perfect. They are not. Pastors have sin natures. We all have sin natures. A pastor may sin more than you do but that's not the point. They've got the doctrine to teach you something so their sins isn't the point. So let's say you have a pastor up here and you're down here, and here you are, and you're idolizing this pastor because he's been teaching you doctrine and you think he's a wonderful person. And then one day uh, you pass him on the street and uh, he does something you don't like, I don't know, some type of sin you don't like. Uh, maybe it's a taboo. Maybe you see him smoking a cigarette, and all of a sudden you say, uh-uh, and you start to pounce on him. Well, it wasn't his fault you put him up there in the first place. 
You put him up there. He didn't want to be up there. You put him up there. So then uh, you say, well, this guy is not worthy anymore. So you put him down here. Now this is arrogance. Why? Because you're being the judge. You put him up here, and then when you don't like him, you put him down here. You're judging. You're being the judge. Who is the ultimate judge? Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to having discernment, you can discern when it comes to a pastor, and you can say, this pastor doesn't teach anything. He's an idiot. Well, just get out of the church. Go somewhere else. Don't hang around. If you think, if you think I'm an idiot, leave. When, what's the point of hanging around if you think I'm stupid? Or, but a lot of people like to you know, jabber, ju -ju 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 -ju, and just like that. But that's part of the sin nature. So, for example, you regard someone as spiritual, and you set them up on a pedestal. And then in your own arrogance, you lift this person up. And then suddenly, when you see that this person has feet of clay, and we all have feet of clay, we all have something in which uh, we have some type of guilt in some area. That's from our area of weakness, which we studied. And we're all going to sin. None of us will ever reach sinless perfection until we die. And then when we die, we'll be sinless. And that's just the way it is. Point four. Jesus Christ, by the way, should be our only role model. If you have any other role model, well, then you're an idiot because everybody has a sin nature. Now, you can have friends and you can have rapport with people who have the same values you do, but if you idolize somebody or if you make somebody your role model, eventually they're going to do something that you're not going to like and then you're going to start stomping on them and trying to destroy them. And let me tell you something. If, that, if the person you're trying to destroy is living within the unique spiritual life, God will lay a discipline on you that you, will, you won't know what hits you. Your head will spin around in circles like the exorcist. He will pounce on you. And that's just the way it is. And we'll get to that. We'll get to the part of the judgment of gossip maligning and uh, those type of sins. Actually, it's double that or triple that. It's called triple compound discipline. Triple that of other sins. So we'll get into that and notice this. So Jesus Christ is our only role model. And to make a role model out of anyone except our Lord is both ignorant and arrogant. And you do not understand the depravity of man. All of us are depraved. You should know that man, to be frank, is no damn good. Man is no damn good. We all have sin natures. We're all going to disappoint each other. But how do we adjust to that? Through the spiritual life, through impersonal love. Now, those are advanced doctrines, and I'm not going to get into that. So, uh, point five. The double standard means that in arrogance, the carnal believer ignores his own sins while slandering, maligning, and judging the sins of others. So there's the polarization. Now, what's the polarization? you got the North Pole and South Pole. Well, the, the two sins are about as different as night and day. One man's out raising hell, and another man's sitting at home in misery gossiping about the man raising hell. That's the polarization of sin, and that happens all the time in Christianity. Now, there is a, set, a part of sin that both uh, areas can, they can commit. For example, the sin of fear. When you get to the emotional sins, both sides can commit those because people really don't think of those as being sin. Fear, uh, worry, anxiety, all of those things, both uh, the antinomian and the legalist can suffer from those, but that's usually overlooked. Point six, there are some key words used by the self-righteous legalist, and that includes the words duty, burden, or responsibility. And in arrogance, they say, well, it's my responsibility to warn you about this other person and about how horrible they are so that you can avoid them. And they say that's their responsibility. No, it's not. It's their responsibility to, to live their own unique spiritual life. Let the Lord deal with his own children. Matthew 7, 5. If you want to turn there, that'd be fine. Matthew 7, 5. Now, this is what Jesus Christ thinks about the legalist or the one who is involved in the legalism trend. Matthew 7, verse 5. And this is where he says, You hypocrite! First, get the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to get the speck of dust out of your brother's eye. In other words, you're spending all your time 
saying, brother, you're doing this wrong. And all he's doing, he might have a little speck of dust and he might be rebounding all the time. And he might have a little speck of dust in his eye because he has a sin nature. Yet there's a big log in your eye and you're blind to the fact that all you do is judge and gossip and malign all day long. And this is what Jesus said about it. You hypocrite, first get the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to get the speck of dust out of your brother's eye. Now, what is he saying? Is he saying once you get the, the log out of your own eye, you can start picking on people then? No. He's saying these people are never going to get the log out of their own eye because they're stuck in legalism. They're stuck in that. They can't get out of it. It's very difficult. They need a big boot stuck somewhere, and it still probably wouldn't get it out of them. So, we're going to look at the sins of the tongue and they are in fact used in several passages. Romans 2.1 Therefore, you are without excuse. Every person, every person who, keep, who keeps judging others, for in that you judge another person, you actually condemn yourself because you, you who are judging actually practice the same things. Now, the blindness of arrogance is that you are committing the worst sins. It was Romans 2.1. The blindness of arrogance is that you are actually committing the worst sins when you malign, slander, or judge someone else, or uh, commit some sin, for, or somebody commits a sin that shocks you, so you have to run around and talk about it. And the self-righteous arrogance of the evil uh, believer, and they are evil, assumes the prerogative of replacing our Lord Jesus Christ as the presiding judge of the Supreme Court of Heaven. Every time you open your mouth to judge somebody, you're in blasphemy. And do you know why? Because you're saying, I'm Jesus Christ. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm the judge. You are not the judge. Jesus Christ screamed out in agony while he was being judged for our sins. What gives you the right to be a judge of somebody else? So let's continue. Oftentimes the believer will seek to control you by gossiping about you, by making you feel guilty. And this is how the weak control the strong through a guilt complex. If somebody tries to make you feel guilty, well, we'll get to that later in the more advanced studies. And then uh, you control, and they try to control you with their little taboos. It's not even found in the Bible. They, they don't like something. For example, uh, one of the taboos of many, many, many years ago was chewing gum. People, that, that was a sin. It's true. Many years ago. And uh, they would uh, make people feel guilty about it. Well, isn't that stupid? Well, there's still taboos today uh, in the same manner. For if you do not conform to those people, they will strike out at you like a brood of vipers. And that's what the Lord called them many times. A brood of vipers. And why vipers? Because nothing is in their soul except bitterness. And that's why he called them vipers. But do not allow such evil people that privilege. For the Scripture commands us not to. And where does the Scripture command us not to? And we looked at this briefly before. Colossians. 2.16. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians 2.16. This is where the Scripture actually commands us not to pay heed to these people. In fact, sometimes I'd like to really chew some of these people out if they ever come around me. Why the confused look? Okay, Colossians 2.16. This is where it says, Consequently, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to food or drink or in the matter of a feast, a new month, or Sabbath days. Now this was legalism under the Mosaic Law that Colossians is talking about. And if you didn't follow the Sabbath days that they had set up, then uh, they would uh, come and nag you about it. Now, what does this say about it? It says, stop allowing anyone to judge you with respect to this. In other words, don't let them do it. You tell them, I'm living by grace. We're not under the Mosaic Law anymore. And just leave them alone. Usually they'll leave you alone anyway if you just uh, give them a stern enough look. 
and I'm not I'm not telling you to get angry. Angry anger is a sin, but it's very simple to avoid these people because if you hang around them, they will suck you into legalism. If you hang around people who are always pious and they say, "Oh, brother, uh, stay away from the wicked wine." And if you're an alcoholic, you probably should. But if they do and they do this and you have a bottle of wine, for example, drink, and that's what it's talking about with respect to food or drink. And if you have that out on your table and somebody comes over and they're in, on your property in your house and they look on your table and they see your bottle of wine and they mention something to them, well, I'd kick them out of my house. I'd say, it's none of your business what I have in my house. You don't like it, you get, you, you know what, get out. <laughs> so point one, legalism judges the sins of other believers. Legalism judges the sins of other believers and whether they're real sins or just taboo, and there are taboos. And point two, through maligning others, the legalist tries to gain respectability, and he often does gain respectability from other legalists and who have the same trend in the sin nature. And therefore, there are entire churches that are formed around this one trend. Entire churches entire legalistic churches formed around this one trend. And one thing I'll never understand, I hear it on the news every now and then, there'll be a church, a, a rather large church, on a rather busy street, and next to the church they'll want to build a strip club. Well, the people in the church have a hissy fit, go into convulsions, like, well, aren't you trying to save the lost world or what? Well, you don't want... Well, build two of them over here. I don't care. Maybe they'll come to church. <laughs> what does it matter? You know? They're sinners. We're sinners. What does it matter? So, uh, let's say some guy's coming from a bar and there's a strip joint right next to the church and he sees this sign out here, Bible Doctrine Church, and he says, you know what, maybe I need to go here instead. And he walks in here and he gets the gospel and believes in Christ. Now, what's wrong with churches that say, oh, we can't have those type of people over here? Well, that's not the good news. You're, you're down on them people. These people need the gospel. And some of them are saved. You'd be, you'd be amazed how many saved people go to strip joints. They do. But if you're a legalist, you wouldn't understand that. But they do. Believe me, they go. Believers go to strip joints. And unbelievers, uh, too. Uh, but what's that, what's that matter? We're, we all have sin natures. And you're shocked. You're shocked by the sexual sins. Now, this always gets to me, especially around this area. And yet, around this area, there's more out-of-wedlock births than anywhere in the country. Go figure. So, everybody's down on uh, the fornication-type people. And it is a sin. I'm not encouraging it at all. It is a sin. It ruins marriages fornication. Everybody's down on this sin, and it is a sin, and they gossip. Over here, these people gossip. Which one is listed in the top worst sins? This one. So these churches constantly gossiping about the other people going to the uh, strip joint or whatever, they're the worst sinners! So we don't really have churches around here. We have legalistic synagogues. And a lot of people there aren't even saved because they spend their time inviting Christ into a sewer when they should be believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't even understand the simple message of the gospel. And that's disgusting. That's disgusting to me. And uh, hopefully there will be a turnaround because if there's not, our country will go under because there are too many churches that are drifting away from grace. And I'm talking churches that have come out of Baraka Church drifting away from grace bit by bit and eventually they'll end up just like every other church around here and then the punishment will come because we need to understand grace. We need to understand what grace is all about. So, uh, legalism judges the sins of other believers whether they are real or whether they are taboo. Point two, through maligning others, the legalist tries to gain respectability and often does gain respectability from other legalists with the same trend of the sin nature. Therefore, entire churches have been formed out of this trend of the sin nature in which everyone in the sin nature maligns and gossips about each other and they get into inordinate competition and that means excessive and they start competing with, with each other who can be the most spiritual. They're focused on people. 
Yeah, you know, what's the song say? What's that song say we were going to sing today? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. It doesn't say turn your eyes upon brother so and so. That's where your eyes need to be. It needs to be on our Lord Jesus Christ. And the sooner you get it on, the, the sooner you get your eyes on the Lord and off of people, the much more peaceful your life will be, and the much more relaxed you will be, the much more confident you will be to break away from such stupidity. So, point three, it is a double standard to judge and malign others while being completely blind to your own sins. You are in blind arrogance and you are ignorant concerning the word of God. People who gossip, malign, and judge all day, they may look spiritual, they may talk a good spiritual fight, they may pat you on the back and say, good morning, brother. But that doesn't mean they're spiritual. They could be gossip maligning and, uh, and ripping you apart behind your back and you wouldn't even know it. And that is part of their sin. And that is means they are spiritual losers and then everybody in the church thinks there's something great and they're not. They are not. They might not even be saved. Point four, by slandering, maligning, in judging other believers, the arrogant believer is not vindicating himself, but he is rather condemning himself. When you judge someone, you are actually condemning yourself, and you're condemning yourself to some severe punishment unless you rebound quickly. Okay, so there are two verses that pertain to the self-righteous or legalistic believer. Romans 14.4, if you want to turn to Romans 14.4 You, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own Lord he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. This is eternal security. When you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord makes us stand, and then everybody else, the legalists all around you, are trying to tear you down. And so what happens is, uh, the Apostle Paul says, You! Who are you to judge the servant of another? And who, who, whose servant is it? You're the servant of the Lord. And they're trying to act like that you're supposed to be their servant is what they're doing, but you're the servant of the Lord. You're not their servant. So they try to manipulate you through guilt. So when, if somebody tries to manipulate you through guilt, maybe just shout at them Romans 14.4. You, who are you to judge the servant of another? I'm the servant of the Lord. In other words, get away from me, you freak. Point one, we are all servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all members of the body of Christ the royal family of God. All of us are royalty. This is found in 1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9. Imagine it. Everyone who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ is royalty. And you have no right to judge other members of royalty. We're all in the same family. We're all royalty. Stop picking on each other. We have an objective, a spiritual objective to get to. And that is pleroma to theu. And if we get to it, we'll have impact and we'll glorify the Lord. But if we don't, we'll be nitpicking on each other and gossiping and maligning about each other and then we'll die the sin unto death and then we'll stand... Well, we're going to get to this in a moment and this should shock you out of that. Point two, the evaluation of our lives is the responsibility of the Lord. And the one exception, of course, is in criminality and then the Lord has granted to government the power to deal with criminals. So that in the case of going to a court and they judge somebody guilty of murder, well that's been left up to the court by the Lord and it's also found in Romans uh, where we are to obey our authorities in terms of the police department and all of that. Here's another verse, Romans 14:10. Romans 14:10. This says, "But you why do you judge your fellow believer? Or you again, why do you regard your fellow believer with contempt? For we shall stand before the Bema seat of Christ. In other words, every single one of us who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ 
One day we are going to stand before our Lord Jesus Christ and this will be during the tribulation. We will not live through the tribulation and we'll study this in dispensations. But at the resurrection of the church, all of us will be resurrected and we will go to be with our Lord and then begins the process of our evaluation. And that's what Bema means. This is the evaluation of each and every one of us. And when we get to that evaluation, if all you have done, and this is what Romans is telling us, Romans is saying, if all you've ever done is judge and gossip and malign about other people, just remember, you're about to be judged, so per se, actually evaluated by our Lord when you get to heaven. And when you get to heaven and uh, the Lord says, what did you do with the unique spiritual life if all you had to offer up was wood, hay, and stubble through your gossip, maligning, and judging, you will be ashamed. Now that's an oxymoron. You'll be in heaven and you'll be happy, but at the same time, you'll be ashamed. Now what happens? When we believe in Christ, all of us receive a deposit of what is called escrow blessings, and that's available to all of us. Every one of us right now has on deposit escrow blessings, and they're ours. When you deposit something in the bank, it's yours. And right now, it's ours. But there are certain conditions, for example, like an IRA or uh, something that you uh, uh, save in, there are certain conditions that you must follow in order to receive that money at the end of the day. So, uh, for the believer who receives the escrow blessings, he has fulfilled the objective. He has fulfilled the uh, what it takes to get that IRA, so to say, out of the bank. Or what do they call it now? What do they call it when you put into, uh, is it an IRA? What do you call it when you put into uh, 401k? That's right. And you have a 401k and there's certain conditions to getting it out. Well, there's certain conditions to getting out your deposit. And one of those conditions is to live the spiritual life. Now, if all of you have ever done is gossiped and maligned and judged your whole life, well, it's still going to be on deposit. But you're not going to get it. You're going to get shame. But on deposit forever. For everyone to see in the hall of records in heaven will be your deposit. And it will be yours, but you can't have it because you didn't live the spiritual life. And when every time you pass by it, that will be a reminder to you that you did not live your spiritual life. Now that should be a motivation for you. But the motivation should not be the rewards that we receive because we will receive many rewards if we go to play Roma to Theu which is the spiritual uh, adulthood, the ultimate in spiritual adulthood. And if we go that far, we will receive many rewards in heaven. And if we don't, we'll be ashamed. So, but uh, that should not be your motivation. The motivation should not be, I'm going to get a crown, so I'm going to work real hard with this spiritual life. You don't work with it anyway. It's by grace. And so you say, I'm going to come to church because I want my reward. That's not the way it works. Uh, you learn Bible doctrine because of your love for God. And it's something called a reciprocal love. You love God, and that's why you learn it. And then you learn about the fact that one day you'll get a crown of righteousness or uh, uh, different types of crowns and uh, wonderful things in heaven. And you learn about these things, but that's not your motivation. Matthew 23, 4, and then... Matthew 23.4 Look up Matthew 23.4 And this is where it says By the time you get there I'll probably be finished saying it But that's okay Matthew 23.4 They tie heavy loads That are hard to carry And put them on men's shoulders but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Now, tying heavy loads, this was the extra-biblical ta taboos that they were using uh, in the Old Testament and during the time of our Lord's presence on the earth. And tying heavy loads, well, that's legalism. People tell the do's and don'ts of society. Don't do this. Don't do that. You must do this. Witness to 50 people. Witness to 100 people. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't chew. Don't go with girls who do. Whatever. So they tie these heavy loads on people. And they're hard to carry. In fact, they're impossible to carry this heavy load when they put it on men's shoulders. 
and then they see the men stumble because they cannot stand up under that legalism. And what do they do when they see their fellow man stumble under the legalism that they created? They judge them. It says right here, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So they stumble under that weight and then everybody says, ah, oh, look at this person. This person's a sinner. So that's what they do. And there's no compassion, no love in that whatsoever. And that's what they do. Wouldn't it be better for somebody to give somebody the good news rather than tell them what to do all the time and to conform to all of that? And what is the good news? Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here this morning without hope, without Christ, and without eternal life, you need to know something phenomenal. You need to know that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for you on the cross. God is perfect, and you would, and if you wish to have a relationship with God, you would have to be perfect, but we can't be perfect. Therefore, Jesus Christ, the God-man, was the perfect as a, sub, died as a perfect substitute for us. And scripture after scripture after scripture tells us the way of salvation. John 3.15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. John 3.18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The issue in salvation is the fact that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you do this once and for all. John 6.47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. And in John 11.25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. So therefore, we have a hope. And if you want that hope, and if you want eternal life, you can simply say, inaudibly, in thought only, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the moment of your salvation. Therefore, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this evening to study your word. May these things edify us to grow in grace and to grow in knowledge. And may we grow to a point to where we can have an impact on our country because we are in desperate need of it. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.